Recovery Sort Of is a podcast where we discuss recovery topics from the perspective of people living in long-term recovery. This podcast does not intend to represent the views of any particular group, organization, or fellowship. The attitudes expressed are solely the opinion of its contributors. Be advised, there may be strong language or topics of an adult nature. Welcome back. It's Recovery Sort of, the podcast. I'm Jason, a guy who loves to learn about other meetings. And I'm Billy. I'm a person in long-term recovery. I'm Caroline. I'm also a person in long-term recovery. And today we have Molly. Hi, everyone. (laughs) Hi, Molly. Sorry. Yeah, I I botched that a little bit, but that's all right. Welcome to the show. (laughs) You're going to tell us about Marijuana Anonymous, which is fascinating. Can't wait to learn more about it. So without any, you know, extra stuff, let's just get right into your story and tell us how you got here. Awesome. Okay. So my name is Molly. I'm a gratefully recovering addict and human being who works Marijuana Anonymous. Um, I am an addict of all trades. So AA, NA, SLAA, I've been to the mall, OA. Um, But Marijuana Anonymous is where I found my home and my people because stoners are awesome, but stoners in recovery are even cooler because we can actually finish a whole conversation. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Um, I've been sober for two years and eight months. My introduction into MA was through my mom. She, uh, you know, was like this stoner addict behavior is no chill for you and for us. And I was still living at home. And, um, you know, why don't you go to a meeting? I mean, I was breaking down crying. Like, I don't like, it makes me, I don't like smoking. It makes me feel awful. Like I can't get anything done. I can't save any money. I can't do anything, but I literally can't stop. And it was, you know, getting me involved in a lot of other stupid shit. And, um, but it was the bait. It was like the basis of my life. Like, all my friends were stoners. Everything I did, I was like, you know, if we go there, is there going to be weed? When can I smoke? You know, is it going to be my weed? Is it going to be their weed? There was so much planning involved to make sure that I would be able to accommodate. Um, well, my why addiction. did it matter whose weed it was? <laughs> oh, because it's, it's just because, you know, it's like if it's going to be theirs, then I won't bring mine because why share my stash if I can just smoke oh, there? Okay you know i thought you were worried theirs was going to be like shitty weed or something your lowly peasant weed i wasn't a pretentious stoner you know those people oh. who are like a high grade this is right. a, oh no i was like as long as it's weed it's cool <laughs> but i mean i was you know struggling college student living at home so money was you know, the basis for making, if I had enough money and I had weed, let's hold on to that as much as I can. Right. So right. If it's other people's weed. That was sick. That was awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway. Um, so I went to a meeting in a church basement and it was a bunch of old white dudes and it was absolutely ridiculous that I could relate to them um, about all of the struggles of being a stoner and having your life feel out of control because of it. And, um, you know, I wasn't like dying from it or, you know, really killing my body besides my lungs, but it kind of felt like I wasn't moving forward. I wasn't moving backwards. I was staying right where I was very much like a shell of the person that I was before and the person I am now, just kind of a zombie moving through life. And Then I was like, okay, this is really scary. I'm never coming back here ever again. Um, I don't like that there's so much self-awareness happening. I'm just going to shut it out. So I kept doing my thing, kept ruining my life for a few more months. And then two weeks into the pandemic, out of money, no job, living at home, couldn't go anywhere, couldn't see friends, couldn't go to the bar, nothing. You know, dispensaries being... um, an essential business in California. They were open, but I didn't have any money and couldn't steal any more money without it being noticeable. So I was left to my own devices and came back to Marijuana Anonymous. 
Um, that's where I met my sponsor during my very first meeting back. Um, and it just took off from there. Um, during my recovery thus far, I've started meetings for young people in recovery in Marijuana Anonymous, um, which have been really like such a beautiful experience to work with minors and adults in recovery um, who are like around my age instead of just 60 year old white dudes in meetings. Um, and uh, really opened me up to a lot of really great service. Um, then I worked at the district level in my district, um, doing treasury and that kind of stuff. And then um, I've been the public information trustee for Marijuana Anonymous World Services for about six or seven months now. Um, and that's been such a rewarding process to do service on the world level and try to bring information about marijuana anonymous to the public that like hey we exist you know addiction to marijuana is super real and there's a lot of real you know physical and emotional circumstances that come from that addiction um so it's been really such a fulfilling experience and strength strengthens my recovery and um yeah i think that's a pretty good overview <laughs> of my story <laughs> No, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I, the first thing I thought of when you said you were like being of service uh, through world services was like, if I had two or three years clean, when I got clean in NA and somebody was said there was another fellowship where I could have like been of service at world service level, I would have felt really important and powerful and I would have switched. <laughs> I'd have been like, yep, I'm going to Marijuana Anonymous from now on. I'm going to work <laughs> with world services. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I found fascinating about your story, and it's not completely about, um, uh, marijuana anonymous was just the idea that when your, when your mom came to you and said this thing about how, what you were doing was not good for you and not good for the people around you that loved you. Like I get, I, I would think, I don't want to say I guarantee, but I would think that's probably not the first time that she said something like that. And it's just fascinating. Like, what's your interpretation of how you heard it differently this time? You know, I think it's that it's that beautiful, like gift of desperation mm. where we had had so many conversations, some starting with me being, you know, really angry and defensive about, you know, I know what's good for me. I know that smoking weed all day every day every hour on the hour is really good for me and you don't understand you don't know what it's like to be me and to go through all the stuff that i was going through and sometimes it would start with me you know sobbing to my mom to my parents like i want to stop smoking it makes me feel awful like i feel like i you know don't have any drive to pursue like anything in life and I know that it you know is frustrating to live with me because I could feel it in our interactions um and obviously my parents were like well you know this is on your time my parents were previous 12 steppers my both my parents have worked a different program and uh I'm trying to protect their anonymity and <laughs> um and uh, so they kind of understood that, you know, an addict can only do it for themselves, but it is really important for them to be aware that like, you know, being helpful to yourself can be helpful to others around you. And I think this time, because it was me coming to her with like, I just need any direction, any help, please. And her being like, I've actually already done research on this. Here it is on a silver platter was just like, too good to be true in that sense and i think just because of some of the circumstances that had happened before i kind of also felt like i owed it to her to like actually hear it, her out and listen and not get defensive and um it's that first little piece of like honesty and open-mindedness and like you know it just kind of goes from there right Right. I, I'm really curious. And, and I love the fact that you've had some exposure to what I'm going to keep referring to, I guess, as traditional 12 step meetings. Right. And when I say that, I'm really talking about AA and NA because that's like the, the main two or whatever. 
But I like that because I feel like it's going to help you see and compare and contrast. I, I will say, though, it sounds like you're more familiar with AA than NA. Yeah, definitely. Okay. More familiar with AA. So, so, like, one of the first things that popped up for me, um, and thinking back that, you know, possibly before you were born, there was a movie called Half Baked. It was like this stoner movie, pop culture stuff. Maybe you've seen it. And there's this line on there where Bob Saget, this wholesome guy from Full House, delivers it in a thing and says, you know, I suck dick for cocaine. Have you ever sucked dick for marijuana? And, and I guess this is like supposedly an NA or an AA meeting environment. And so I guess there's there's been this lingering stigma of like, marijuana is not serious enough to need a 12-step program or, or that somebody might get laughed out of a more traditional meeting. I think that stems from the idea that we think we're treating this disease of addiction and not just one particular substance, so to speak. But I don't, I don't think AA actually thinks, oh, we're just treating alcohol in here, right? Like, So I think maybe it's not as awkward for you because your exposure has been AA who kind of already operates under this, like, we're not really dealing with a substance, but that's what we call the program. Do you want to talk? About, I know that was like not exactly a question, but <laughs> no, I, I I think I get what you're. I think I get where you're coming from, and um, you know, I, I think it is true that a lot of people, um, you know, sort of think that marijuana is. I mean, and this is this comes from just like you said, pop culture and all of these like other things where, you know, weed isn't bad. It's right. not. Like, I mean, it's a gateway drug if you did like the D.A.R.E. program when you were in elementary school, like I did. You know, it is one of the gateway drugs, but it's not like a big deal. But, you know, and that's sort of what my exposure to it was as well. Like, you know, people like Snoop Dogg and Kid Cudi, like all these guys, they smoke weed all day, every day, and they're super successful. And, you know, they've lived great lives. Um, and I think the reality of it is that weed can be really helpful to a lot of people. It is and did sort of in this new movement, especially when, uh, for me, you know, was seen as like medicinal for a lot of people. And there are some functional people. And like with everything, there are a lot of unfunctional people who smoke a lot of weed. And um you know, to the point of like from the movie, from Half Baked, from the line, I know lots of people who have, you know, not to be vulgar or anything, but <laughs> who have, you know, sucked dick to get weed. Mm. That, you know, it's it doesn't really matter what the substance is. If the desperation is there, right. you're going to do what you need to do. And there are a lot of people in MA, I think, who have felt laughed out of other programs, including AA, because especially here in California, um, you know, there's a bit of that like California recovery where it's like, I don't drink, I just smoke weed all day. Mm -hmm. And I still get to go to AA meetings and I still get to take my chip, still get to do all of that, mm -hmm. which as you should, that's your, that's the singleness of purpose. There you go. Like it just, it doesn't work for everyone. A lot of people find the the issues of cross addiction there where it's like, I know that I'm sober from alcohol, so I'm not, you know, suffering from all of the very physical stuff and detrimental stuff that can happen with alcoholism, but I'm just smoking weed all day sitting on my couch and I don't really know what I'm doing with my life. Like right. the program is supposed to, you know, help us be useful people in society and you know, the sort of consensus in Marijuana Anonymous is that a lot of us have the experience that we're very unfunctional, useless people when we're smoking all day, every day to ourselves and to other people. So I think that's just sort of the general misconception that just because I can't overdose from it doesn't mean that it's not really harmful. Right, right. Yeah, I think sometimes we can give uh, priority levels, which uh, kind of makes sense if people are, yeah. you know, passing away. But at the same time, it doesn't mean we need to like belittle or, or you know, lessen the struggles of anybody else. I'm, I'm curious, and, and our background is more N.A., so that's kind of where my understanding comes from mostly. So I, just thinking like in N.A., the disease of addiction is kind of what we refer to as the the problem, so to speak, right? It's not 
the actual drug use. They're more of like a symptom. Does Marijuana Anonymous look at that similarly? Or how do you guys look at this idea? Is it the disease model of addiction and you're just referring more to one specific thing or? Yeah, I think it definitely follows that same sort of pipeline of like, you know, this is the disease of addiction and like the spiritual ailment that exists, like trying to fill an emotional, spiritual void with a substance. And I think, yeah, MA does follow that in in a very similar, if not, you know, the same sort of way. So, yeah. Okay. Do you guys, uh, is it, do you still call it clean time? Yeah. Okay. And we is do. there... Is there like celebrations or anniversaries in your program or not? As yeah, much? so we do we do chips the same way that other programs do them. And, you know, 30, 60, 90 days, six months, a year. And um, whatever meetings you go to, we have like official MA chips and, you know, you can buy them and um, all of that kind of stuff. And then um, it... it honestly doesn't differ very much from other traditional programs in that sense. I mean, we've definitely followed a very similar pipeline. Okay. With that being said, what is like the feel? So if you go to AA, depending on what area you're in, you might be asked to not talk about anything except alcohol. Um, whereas some areas, you know, it's not as big of a deal to talk more about other things you've done. What's the vibe around that in marijuana anonymous? Is it like we need to strictly speak about marijuana or do people talk about all kinds of things? Or? I think people, um, so we do talk a lot about cross addiction, actually. I mean, obviously depending on the meeting and depending, you know, on that meeting or that district's particular, you know, script or that kind of stuff, um, mm -hmm. for their meetings, um, but yeah, we talk a lot about cross addiction um, because, you know, when you're trying to get off of one drug, it's very easy to just pick up another. Um, and in, in our scripts often, you know, there's a sort of statement that's like many of us have found that when we're, you know, stopping when we're not smoking weed we drink more and we drink more and more and more or we you know use our medications that are prescribed a little bit you know we get a little bit dicey with them like you know you kind of have to be aware that cross addiction can exist in you know while you're trying to recover um from one addiction so most meetings that i've been to um don't really enforce the singleness of purpose too, too much. Um, of course, like we have meetings that sort of coincide where we're like, this is a, a, you know, this is like a relationship topic meeting in MA. We're talking about how relationships, which of course you can see that in like CODA or in SLA, like those other sort of smaller programs that do talk solely about relationships. Um, how they can sort of intertwine in a singular meeting. Um, but of course, most people are there to recover from weed. So the sort of cross addiction, I think it would be pretty similar in a sense where people are like, I know this is an NA meeting, but, or I know this is an AA meeting, but I really need to talk about this. And this is my home group, or this is the meeting that I was able to get into. And I just need to share. That's sort of the vibe around it as well. Hmm. Molly, are there a lot of people that, uh, or even a good portion of the people that attend um, MA, at least that you're familiar with, that are strictly there to solve for their marijuana addiction, but continue to drink or use other substances recreationally? Or is it like a total abstinence model? Um, I think, you know, it's interesting um, and this is obviously my just my perspective um, that what I've seen and what I've noticed is that oftentimes people come in being like, well, I'm just a stoner and I, I just need to stop smoking weed all day every day. I only drink on the weekends or like once a month. So it's fine. And then they find pretty early in recovery in their first few months or so that they're drinking more and more and it's becoming a problem that they're drinking more and more to co to compensate with 
you know, not smoking all day, every day. So I think the people that I know that have stayed in long-term recovery from weed are like completely abstinent from other, all other mind and mood altering substances. Is that what the program advises though? Like, so say if you're sponsoring someone, okay. So if you're sponsoring someone, you're telling them they, they need to abstain from, from all substances. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I think uh, I think other sponsors would probably come at it from a different way. But I'm like, you know, I get it. Singleness of purpose. You're here to just stop smoking weed. But my answer is going to be the same every time you come to me with, well, I got really drunk. And when I was drunk, I smoked because I couldn't even really, you know, think about it. And I was like, oh, I just want to have a good time. And you're continually relapsing. My answer is going to be the same, which is don't drink don't participate in those things that you need to stay fully clean and sober. Um, And, you know, some come around to it, I think eventually, but to hold any type of like service positions in marijuana anonymous, you have to be completely clean and sober from all mind and mood altering substances besides stuff like nicotine, caffeine, and then any prescribed drugs taken as prescribed. That's actually pretty fascinating that that's kind of like a requirement. (laughs) So... I'm curious, is there like any, and and I guess I feel like most of this happens in person and I, it sounded like you do mostly virtual meetings, but I'm curious if there's any vibe of like conflict between this person celebrating and we don't think they're actually not drinking or this person celebrating and we all think they're using their pills wrong or like, does any of that happen in marijuana anonymous? Cause I've seen a lot of that in other places. Yeah, it does. I think it happens. I've been to quite a few in-person meetings. I have some around me and that kind of stuff, um, especially as the world has reopened. (laughs) But I think it's very similar to that in other programs where you can sort of sense or like get that sort of vibe from someone that maybe they're not fully, you know, being honest about their experiences. Um, And a lot of people will come at it with you know, judgment, like, oh, that person probably shouldn't be taking a chip, or I don't think this person should be sharing, because I think they probably did smoke in the last 24 hours, um, just based on their share. Um, And then at the end of the day, um, like AA, I'm not sure about in NA, Um, you know, we sort of try to put principles before personalities and, you know, pray for the addict who still suffers and are just glad that they're in the meeting and whether or not they're lying, that really is them like, you know, pouring the poison and drinking it themselves. It doesn't really affect me and my recovery, um, but it does for them. So we just say, I hope the next time you're here, you can be more honest and say, you know what, last time I was here, I, I was high and, you know, I want to apologize to the meeting. I want to make an amends to the meeting or they just do it in their living amends and, and we can see the change in them. But um, yeah, I would say that it's very, very similar that sort of like, I can see it, but we don't really say anything because they're here for just any amount of hope from other people. Right. So I'm curious with the, kind of recommendation that people are free of all mind and mood altering substances what is like i guess the the promise of your program or or what your program says is possible like for for narcotics anonymous they say that an addict any addict can stop using lose the desire to use and find freedom from active addiction or whatever right like and aa has its own version of some different promises like are is marijuana marijuana anonymous's stance that you will be free from marijuana or that you would be free from everything since it seems like there was a little bit of that in the program i mean i think to stick to the singleness of purpose it does say that you'll be free from your your marijuana addiction but because the program does come at it with this sort of like 
you know, addiction is a disease and a spiritual malady, very similar to the way the big book sort of talks about it, where our promises are very similar to the AA promises, you know, like we'll be amazed before we're halfway through, we'll find a new, you know, the whole thing. We have our own that talks about how, you know, marijuana is um, X, Y, Z. I mean, I can pull it up and and read it to you guys, but, um, you know, it does talk about specifically we'll be free from marijuana addiction and we'll feel like useful people will feel present in our relationships. We won't be struggling with money anymore. Like these are the promises that we make. Um, and then, you know, during a meeting, oftentimes cross addiction is brought up that, this can hinder you from experiencing that spiritual freedom and the freedom from addiction, from active addiction, because, you know, it is a disease and we have it always, but, right. you know, you'll feel more free from the chains of, of marijuana for sure. Um, and that they can definitely get in the way of that. That's pretty much sort of the vibe. It's like, we know that this is singleness of purpose um, and we want to st- stay to that but at the same time we definitely think that it'll take you a lot longer to maybe a lot more struggles to get to that freedom that we're talking about if you know you're actively in other addictions as well right right you know because because addiction is is a disease of all of this stuff i mean the drug of choice is definitely the one that we want to stop doing But it doesn't mean that the other ones are just like, oh, I'm not an addict when I drink. I'm only an addict when I smoke. I mean, that's a a kind of a little bit. uh, I'm I'm not going to say silly, but that's the word I want to say. Like, it's a little bit silly to think that that would be the case. If you think, you know, addiction is more than just physical dependency. It's really interesting because as we're having this conversation, I'm realizing that marijuana anonymous is clearly like a direct splinter from AA and not a direct splinter from NA. So like NA broke off, right? At mm-hmm. some point in time and then marijuana anonymous clearly broke off directly from cuz there there's so much of it from AA has been retained that it it just that the family tree almost is a little different than maybe I would have imagined had we had this conversation. Um well, I think that's true for most of them. Yeah, I mean, I guess because it AA is, is where they go to get permission to use the steps to begin with. But they could come to NA. They, yeah, but no, we don't give permission for people to use the steps because AA does. Because well, we got permission from AA. Yeah, but now we've copyright copyrighted our steps, so in theory, someone could come to us. They could, but that's like you. Uh, asking somebody to stay at your house and watch it and then them asking somebody else to do it <laughs> it's a little like Argh. watch what i'm so confused if now. you were going away for a month and you were like oh. come watch my house for a month and then they asked somebody else to come watch your house for a month oh. that would feel weird oh, like that oh yeah. that's an interesting uh <laughs> that would be weird yeah <laughs> so i yeah i think they are but but yeah but yeah this one definitely closely related maybe more so than others uh molly you said the the meeting is kind of, or the program at least, is more like traditional, like a traditional 12-step program. When going into a meeting, virtual or in person, what might somebody who's only been to traditional 12-step meetings be surprised by or might find a little bit different or fascinating about a Marijuana Anonymous meeting? Like, is there a different vibe? Or, or you know, I mean, one thing, like the old... Like we, we have pictures of like what people in NA look like, like these kind of wildish looking people dressed crazy and crazy colored hair. And then there's like the They're AA called person. stereotypes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the AA person who's like prim and proper wearing a sweater, right? right you know, yeah. like is there, a, is there a marijuana anonymous person or vibe? I mean, I think it would be very similar. Um, Baggy pants and a chain wallet. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, yes. Yeah. Grateful Dead shirt. I like. mean, it's interesting because MA, um, it started in San Francisco. Um, so the when, vibe. Is, Molly, do you know the year? It started, okay, I don't know the year. So excuse my history, my MA history lapse. Don't but it bad. definitely started like in the 70s, 80s. It's been around for a long time. 
Um, but and a lot of those people who started the meetings, um, they still are in program. Like they're like people that like I've met and they like went to that first meeting on that street in San Francisco that everyone talks about. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah. And like, I just went to, we had a fellowship convention in October. um, And I like, you know, I got to experience meeting some of these people. The vibe is very much like, to me, very like hippie peace and love more than like, like that baggy chain, like sort of (laughs) like, if we're thinking about stereotypes, it's very much like more you know i still wear rastafarian but i just don't smoke weed all day sort of vibes and a lot of people are like i still have my stoner brain even though i haven't been smoking for like 10 years like (laughs) i still like forget things i still like all the stereotypes i'm just you know sober and able to like own up to it and like all of that kind of stuff instead of being like oh it's because i was hot like okay (laughs) you know it's it's definitely more like that and i think people would be surprised I think more so people would be surprised that we are very traditional. I I think that would be the big surprise to people because I think a lot of people assume that we're going to be like, do it how you want and work the steps how you want. And of course, that's the case, like with everything. But it's also like you should follow these suggested steps and you should be thorough and you should be honest. And when you do your inventories, like, don't just be like, well, because I was high. It's like, how did this actually affect you? And like, what is this spiritual malady like causing you? And what are you trying to, what void are you trying to fill? And how can you get to the root of this and feel that freedom? I think a lot of people just assume that it's like, we're like, kind of in that sense, in AA, I don't know if there's an NA term for it, where it's like, like drunk logging, you know, where it's a meeting and everyone's just sharing like all their like greatest hits of all the times that they fucked up because of, you know, drinking or getting high or getting loaded. We call it telling war stories. Telling war stories. Okay. Or, or drug a log. I've yeah. heard that one. A drug a log. Yeah. So it's very similar where it's like, I think a lot of people assume that we're going to sit around and sort of like, like almost like a blunt rotation and just talk about all the time. <laughs> Remember that time we saw Zeppelin? Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. And like, um, no, it's actually like, it can be a very serious and vulnerable space because, mm. you know, for a lot of people that, I mean, this is why we're here that it got so desperate. It got so bad that we went onto our computers and was like, Alcoholics Anonymous, but for stoners, is that possible? Can I be addicted to pot? Can I do that? I mean, it takes a minute to find us because we are, you know, not as well known. Or you have to search. You have to find us. And and once you do, you kind of want to take it seriously because it's gotten so bad. And not like, oh, we're going to you need your you need a court card signed. So go to M.A. Like, no, they're going to send you to AA and then you're like, okay, well, I'm not an alcoholic. So, you know, F this. It takes a while to get to our program. It's definitely one of like, if you think about the houses on a block and like AA is the first one and then NA is the second one. And then, you know, it's one of the last houses on the block, which is why a lot of people are clean and sober from other things because they started in AA or they started in NA and they were like, I get the vibe because I'm an addict and this makes sense to me. But when I'm doing step work or when I'm reading the book, I switch out, you know, alcohol for weed or, you know, drugs for weed specifically. Um, And then they find us and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm home. Like I'm ready to go. Like I want this so bad. So there are a lot of things that, uh, sorry to cut you off. There are things I think that are kind of, I'll say unique to marijuana addiction in that like a lot of people say like the stereotypical like marijuana is not addictive and that there's no withdrawal and those kind of things, which we know that's not really true. Um, but that's sort of a, a, I don't know, common misconception of the general population is that like marijuana is not addictive and there's not really withdrawal. So you can't really have a you shouldn't really have a problem with it, you know, so it must feel nice to have a group of people that feel differently than that. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's definitely the case. And I don't know um, if you guys have heard of of CHS. Have you ever heard of that? No. It's um, 
okay it's a big medical word <laughs> but basically it's like the the physical effects of being addicted to weed can cause like a lot of like stomach issues like people who are completely dependent on smoking weed to like keep food down or weed makes them throw up all day every day and there are people in program who have lived with CHS for years in their active addiction throwing up or like not being able to eat having awful pain in their bodies for years and thinking oh well weed's not addictive and it's a medicine it's got to be helping me with this process where in fact it's the root of the problem and they have no idea because when they go to the doctor doctors don't really I mean they do because it's a diagnosable thing but it's not very commonly known in the medical field that there is this really physical um, medical illness that can come from like long term or even just very aggressive marijuana use and you know this idea that it's not addictive and that there's no physical um you know symptoms of addiction there is it can be seen it's definitely there are parts of it that are true in the sense where it's like well my body's not going to go into failure from not having it but at the same time mentally I'm so dependent on that escape that not having it sends you into an entire thing that feels very, very, very physical. So the first time I went into a meeting and I heard other people sharing about their experiences with CHS, their experiences with emotional and like physical withdrawal from marijuana was like one of the most comfortable things I've ever heard, but also very scary. Like I said, like it made me want to run where I was like, okay, I'm not these people. I'm just kidding. I'm not, no, 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 no. Because it, because I felt so seen for right. like the first time trying to get sober. So that's cannabinoid, I'm going to say this wrong, hyperemesis syndrome, which is yeah. CHS. And uh, yeah, actually, uh, now that you say that, I didn't know the name, but I have read a little about that. And Maybe that's like episode material since yeah. it's not a well-known thing and we should tell more people. Um, it's, it's, I feel bad. Like you're over here informing us all this really valuable, important information. And I'm over here like, I wonder if they have stuff like mocktails, but for weed, right? Like, like <laughs> well, mock CBD brownies and is a thing or, now. So like CBD uh, yeah. is supposed to be, you know, non uh, psychoactive or right. whatever. Like, is that like near beer for alcoholics? Like how, yeah, do how does that deal work? with all that? <laughs> I just saw there was a pamphlet about it. So, <laughs> Yeah, I was about to say, we have a pamphlet about it. And um, essentially, CBD is one of those things I think like, you know, near beer or anything that's like 0%, um, all of that kind of stuff. It really is up to you and your program and, and if you feel like it would be triggering. For me, if I were to smoke CBD weed that's like 0% THC, I would be expecting it to get high. Like I would be expecting that and it would be upsetting to me, <laughs> and, but like, I'm also still kind of a baby in program where like, I haven't been sober for very, very long. And a lot of things could still be triggering to me. So I'm like, I'm not going to touch that. And currently there's no like big pull to like do some research and figure out if it's super triggering for me personally. But I know some people who are like, I use CBD drops because I have chronic pain and that's why I started smoking weed in the first place mm -hmm. because the medicinal effects of it, which generally come from the CBD are really, really valuable to me. Um, and that's sort of like up to you and potentially your sponsor, their guidance on it. And then maybe a medical professional, if you have access to that, to have like a full conversation about using CBD in a medicinal way instead of using it to try and cope with not being able to get high because you may find out that it's really upsetting that you're using cbd and you're going to the dispensary to get cbd and you're not getting weed like with thc in it and it's really upsetting so it's sort of that line like with anything it's like is it going to trigger you specifically no go for it if you think so probably stay away from that so AA's got the the big book, NA's got the basic text, and of course I I don't think either of those books are actually titled that, but that's what they're they're <laughs> yeah. known as pretty widely. What is the the literature for marijuana anonymous like? 
Yeah, so we um, have a book called Life with Hope. And um, we also have a Life with Hope workbook that sort of walks a marijuana anonymous, uh, a marijuana addict through the process of the 12 steps, um, sort of referencing back to Life with Hope. And um, Life with Hope is very similar to um, something like the big book or th- what's the NA's literature called? Sorry. The basic text. That's the okay. basic text. <laughs> Um, it's very similar to that, but obviously it's very, it's specific to addict, the marijuana addict experience of, you know, the very first page of Life with Hope talks about, you know, we tried to control it. We told ourselves we're only going to smoke, you know, after work, after school, on the weekends, or we're only going to smoke other people's weed. We're going to hide it here and here and here and here. But then you hide it when you're high, so you can't find your stash, so you go buy more, and then you find it later, and, like, you get back into the cycle. Like, we've all tried to control our using that way. And the first time I read that, I was like, oh, my gosh, I've done literally every single one of these things to try and control my using. And it goes from there into, you know, a lot of that very specific like what stoners would feel or like, you know, marijuana addicts would feel um, in their active addiction, what that insanity looks like for them. Um, And you can access Life with Hope like on our website and, you know, you can order it on Amazon. Um, And then we're, we're about to come out with a daily reader. We've been working on it for years now. Um, and like the, all the literature just got approved during our last conference. So like it's going to be coming out hopefully within the next year or so, um, which is going to be great, like written by people that I know and love. And um, it's it's awesome that we are, we're, we have such a broad um, amount of literature for such a small um, meeting space. So in my understanding in AA, there's no particular like separate book or guide to working the steps there's things that people have pulled out of their their big book you know that refer to working steps and how to do it in the process in na we have a specific what's called the step working guides and yet we use it as like here answer all these questions do you guys have a formal step working booklet or is it done a different way tell us a little about that process yeah so we do have a workbook that you can that you can get and access either a physical copy. We also have an app, like a marijuana anonymous app that has access to all of the literature, the entire Life with Hope book. And for the free? Entire, huh? For free? For free. Holy and the entire goodness. Life with Hope workbook. And you can literally type your answers right into the app and it'll save your answers. And you can like and you can send it to your sponsor. You can email it through the app to someone else. Um, and then you can sort of work through it like completely virtually because so many of us like MA took off during the pandemic. Like the amount of people who were coming into meeting spaces being like, I'm actually literally stuck at home all day, every day, being able to smoke weed all day, every day. Like this is insanity. Um, and the fact that it was so accessible in the app already, like the app had already been developed and was out there, um, was so helpful for people who were like, I need to start working this right now. I can't even wait for a book to come in. It's like, oh, here's the app right here for free wow, for you to read. That's and awesome. like, here's the workbook and it is formal. Oh, excuse me. It is formal. And, um, yeah, it's just called the life with hope workbook. Wow, I gotta be honest. I feel like y'all just shit all over NA with that one. That's awesome. <laughs> that's impressive. Yeah, that's really impressive. all free literature <laughs> and the way to work the steps right in the app. So I, I guess uh, just to follow up on that a little bit, like I guess I would say historically, or my understanding of like AA, it's kind of like you talk through the steps more than you specifically like write them out. In NA, we at least in this area specifically, we typically more like write them out, like get a notebook and write out answers, and it can be a fairly uh, lengthy or time-consuming process. Uh, how does MA relate to either of those? Is it different, same? No, I think it's pretty similar to the NA um, sort of concept. It takes a little bit more time. 
for sure, because it it is fairly writing based. The questions are like, write this down and be thorough. I mean, a lot of people I, I know in A did the same thing, writing it down yeah. and that kind of stuff. Um, but it's also the same in the sense like, um, you know, you're not really fully done with the step until you talk it out. And um, for me personally, with my sponsees, I'm like, if you want to do a bullet point like list for this one, because you don't want to write 10 pages about it, and you'd rather like have the main points you want to talk about when we talk, when we sit down and do step work, um, let's do that. Like, obviously we want to be honest and thorough, but writing 15 pages on this thing is not really beneficial unless you want to. I mean, some people are like, yeah, sure. I mean, it'll be the best way for me to get my thoughts out. But hmm. it's definitely one of those uh, processes that's like, there are quite a few questions in each step, um, especially the first three. Uh, so writing it down makes it a little bit easier to just when you sit down to do step work with your sponsor. Um, and this is from my personal experience. Everyone in MA can work it differently. But it's just been helpful to do it that way, to sort of have something written down and then also be able to talk it out just sort of depending and like all stoners I mean even in recovery I'm like oh shit I forgot that okay yeah <laughs> really quick. you know like oh oh wait like that makes a lot of sense I'm I'm actually putting this together right now um I mean that happens with everyone but stoners especially very forgetful people well since you said it that's the first thing I thought when you said that your daily meditation book was taking years and years of time I was like oh yeah that's because you're all stoners like that's why mm -hmm. it takes forever <laughs> But I don't want to say that, but since you just brought it up. <laughs> no, yeah, you can throw me under the bus on that one. <laughs> So I, I'm going to take an assumption here and assume that all this looks pretty similar to what it looks like in the other fellowships that maybe we're all more familiar with. But just to ask, just to be curious, does the idea of sponsorship and having a strong network of like peers, like do these things, are they really prevalent in the Marijuana Anonymous program? And so, and, and in fact, a dual part of that question, I think, I believe in N.A., sponsorship itself isn't mentioned in the basic literature i guess i mean we have a pamphlet about it but it, it talks about it being like informal in nature or like implied in nature there's a word they use and i can't think of the right word but it but it's not like a formal practice we don't talk about it lay it out talk about who has to be your sponsor or that you have to have one but it's kind of like we all sort of believe that that's the way it works tell us about how that looks and, and your recovery network in ma is it the same yeah, it's very similar. I mean, I think like with other programs, we have like a spiritual toolbox that we definitely suggest that's recommended. And that's, you know, having a strong network, connecting with fellows, um, you know, having people that you can reach out to and then having a sponsor. Um, and we have this um, on our website. We have like a find a sponsor thing that you can fill out. And if there's, because MA is not like I can find a meeting in every city sort of vibes, the way that I could pretty much find an AA meeting anywhere I go, it's hard to find an in-person sponsor, like someone that I can even just drive to in like an hour. Sometimes people are in s such remote parts where the nearest city doesn't have MA meetings either. So we have like a find a sponsor um, page that you fill out. And then one of the people who do who does service for our program will connect you with someone else. And you can read you can do it with as many people as you want. And people who are willing to sponsor and willing to sign up will give their name and their number and are like willing to have people reach out to them for potential sponsorship. Um, and it's been a really helpful tool, especially during the pandemic when was like, I need a sponsor and I want to work the 12 steps, but I literally couldn't even drive 15 minutes to go see someone. So, you know, I think it was, it's been a really, it sort of that find a sponsor thing came out um, right around the pandemic. I think 
because of that, but it really helped people in program find those resources. But like with every 12 step, we're like, if you hear someone's story and you like their experience and you want what they have and they're willing to sponsor, go and talk to them after the meeting, reach out, ask for their number, try and connect with them. And hopefully you find a connection that works for you. It's very similar to other programs in that, in that way. It sounds like MA, um, it sounds like MA has done a much better job of making use of today's technology than than maybe NA or AA just with this app this interactive app and the find a sponsor functionality on your website um yeah I was actually going to speak to that too I was wondering if maybe the difference is AA and NA have been around for a long time and yeah, so the people yeah. that sit on our boards are old white men mm-hmm. yeah NA um, was 53 and AA was 34 five right I so, I'm, so i'm just wondering yeah. if the younger generation maybe. well yeah maybe the people in the service positions in ma since it's not so well established and so long-standing maybe there are a lot of younger people who are thinking through these ideas of like hey it's it's 2023 let's like act like it <laughs> or they're just not <laughs> stuck with their old ways of doing things like right. this is the way we've been doing it for 40 years so we can't change you i know? see people <laughs> on the um one of what there's a na facebook group in this in this general area that we're in molly and I'll see people occasionally post on there that they need a sponsor and they'll get 30 responses saying, go to a meeting. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty stupid. Yeah. That I mean, of the, the I'm pretty online. sure. Yeah, NA still takes literature votes and stuff like that through Carrier Pigeon. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. we're, uh, we are not on board with 2023 technology. I, yeah, I, I do want to... Oh, go ahead. I, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I think it comes from, obviously, we have like those old timers in program that have been, you know, sober in MA for three decades or, you know, three and a half decades, that kind of stuff. But I think it does come from having sort of this like younger sort of mindset and having younger people in program. I mean, there's a ton of young people in MA, um, mainly because, you know, weed is like 90% THC, like wax pens are crazy. Like, marijuana induced psychosis and chs are skyrocketing because of like the hybridization like all of that like really sciencey weed stuff that happens that like sends people into tailspins after six months of using so we have so many young people and then people like me who want to get involved and we go to the ma conference and it's a bunch of old people yelling at each other like i love my board love the board that i work with so if you're listening um love you but at the same time i'm like this needs to change like this is not appealing this is not accessible this is not you know helpful to a lot of people so we need to get in there and change it and there were people before me that were doing that i've only been in this position for a few months but all of this stuff existed before because our webmasters, our internet people, they're all like really dedicated to making this accessible for not just like our country, but other countries, I guess. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at your description of that useful, like people who know technology and what's needed and all that. And I was thinking of like somebody who was running our, our web services in this area, (laughs) somebody who like, you know, probably doesn't know how to get his email forwarded from the website <laughs> right. to his email. <laughs> it's just like, damn. And, and and it's not a knock on that guy. Like, hey, thank you for stepping yeah. up and being a service. But like, yeah, where are all course. the people who understand? Yeah, these he's things? not the most technologically advanced. Right, right. So I I imagine that since it sounds like, um, you know, you guys have this influx of younger people, but also quite a few maybe established 12 step members or seasoned 12 step members who've kind of migrated over to get some specialized, you know, help or, or support for this particular issue, marijuana, right? I would imagine that all the old vibes from traditional meetings carry through like, oh yeah, we don't cross talk around here and no dating in your first year. Like, are they strong presences in marijuana or anonymous or maybe they're more afterthoughts there? No, they're definitely, I mean, they're pretty strong in in our program and they're in all of our literature, you know, that it's suggested not to get involved with newcomers and matters of romance or business, like very similar to that same, like Hmm. to that traditional structure. Um, And, you know, we have non-crosstalk meetings and crosstalk meetings and, you know, stuff that sort of 
opens up the space if you want to hear crosstalk and there's a specific like script and format from district to district i mean it's sort of like there's a general script layout and then like with anything if you vote within your meeting or within your district that you want it to sound different then you can do that and here's our letter here's the scripts that we provide and you can change it um but yeah very similar definitely you know no crosstalk and and uh, not dating in your first year is recommended or suggested, but talk with your sponsor sort of thing. Yeah, what happens if you forget you're not supposed to date in your first year? <laughs> Sorry, just being humorous. Just no, I was right, going right. to say, I mean, I think a lot of, I mean, a lot of people do it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious about this. I don't imagine that this is a, a large uh I want to say issue for Marijuana Anonymous, but generally, like, we've talked to people. I mean, Billy will share that he knows people that have come to Narcotics Anonymous but haven't been there for a problem with drug use, so to speak. They've been there for other problems. Maybe they had a disordered relationship with sexual material or with sex or with eating. Like, when they haven't been able to find these more specialized meetings locally, people have attended and, you know, to some level either been accepted or not. Uh, I was curious, what is marijuana anonymous's feelings or, or maybe even just what would your feelings be if somebody showed up to a marijuana anonymous meeting but maybe marijuana wasn't specifically their problem like i said i can't imagine that's as big of an issue for you guys being as specialized as you are but like do you think you'd be welcoming to somebody that came in and was struggling with something else yeah i think um like you said it's definitely not as big of like um situate it's not a situation that happens too often because most people come from going to aa mm -hmm. and then a really nice fellow is like hey i've heard about marijuana anonymous or they have like a poster in their meeting hall that's like you're struggling with weed like here go to marijuana anonymous meetings because one of our members one of our fellows you know was going around putting up flyers for their district like that's sort of how people have found us in the past so it doesn't happen too often but overall we're like at least my experiences in meetings that i've been to um if people are there like i don't really know if i have a problem with weed but you know i'm here because i think i have a problem with xyz and this was the only meeting i could find which I don't, I don't think Odd, I've ever right? seen that before, <laughs> but if it did, I would assume that the people in the meetings and in the fellowship would be really accepting, would want to hear them out, let them share, let them experience our strength and hope. And then hopefully during any fellowship time after the meeting, they're like, hey, did you know that Alcoholics Anonymous exists? Like, <laughs> <laughs> they're the basis from our program too. Like, go there. <laughs> like. Right. I think I think that would sort of be the situation like you're obviously welcome to come back, but there is a program that works what you're looking for. Like a lot of people in MA, I think the overlap happens a lot with like, like vaping or nicotine or smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are like, did you know nicotine anonymous exists like you can go there like that's a meeting space that you can go to I've been to it. Here's some resources like you can sort of find that overlap where they're like, well, I've you know, I haven't been smoking weed that much, but I literally can't stop hitting my vape. Like, you know, and I'm like, right. yeah, I also here's Nicotine Anonymous if you want to try it out, but definitely come back to our meeting. Like, we're happy to have you. And and I didn't know that existed. So get on that, Caroline. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want Nicotine Anonymous. I'll connect yeah. you with yeah. some resources. There Caroline. we go. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good, Molly. I'll take them. Yeah. Well, and you brought up an interesting thing that I didn't really think about. I guess as we've seen like the legalization of marijuana and the potencies getting way higher and, you know, them incorporating marijuana into whatever, anything you can think of now, lollipops, gummies, food, yeah. vapes, everything, I guess with the the potencies and everything getting so much higher that really probably does create a lot of problems for people wait till they start putting uh marijuana air yeah, right. <laughs> just buy the you air just inhale it right <laughs> just breathe it in right yeah it'd be perfect those yeah. smoke in a bag yeah. <laughs> i mean they, stoners will do that on their own yeah. right so they're like why buy it i mean we're very frugal people what well, a, a question this might not specifically be for Marijuana Anonymous, but maybe you and your experience in service, or if Marijuana Anonymous does try to address this at all. So 
I guess, access to treatment sometimes for just like a straight marijuana addiction can be kind of challenging. Like, of course, we hear so much about opioids and opioid money and treatment for opioids, but there doesn't seem to be that funding stream or funding source for people with just a a marijuana. I say just, but, you know, that people have specifically a marijuana addiction. Do you guys know of or do you know of any resources for that sort of thing? Or how do you encourage people to get into treatment? Yeah, that's it's sort of like one of the biggest parts of the service that I do. And so we do have like an H&I um, program as well, which is hospitals and institutions, you know, and we do a lot of outreach, which essentially can look like cold calling hospitals, institutions, that kind of stuff being like, hey, we exist and you can, you know, use this as a resource to inform yourselves and your staff on marijuana addiction, marijuana induced psychosis, CHS, that kind of stuff. Um, and like cannabis use disorder, which is what can happen and what you can get diagnosed with if you go to the hospital and say like, I am a marijuana addict and it and like it makes me feel awful. They can diagnose you with cannabis use disorder. Um, in terms of like a rehab or like a facility, um, generally the programs that they're gonna work are obviously AA or NA. And then for the specific marijuana addict who's in rehab, they often are, you know, sort of doing that sort of code switching, like I was talking about earlier, like thinking about like writing in weed instead of alcohol when they're working program in a rehab. Um, but hospitals and institutions and PI public information, which, which is what I do, we do a lot of that, that outreach to the public, to um, different facilities nationally or just within our local groups to spread this information that we have and that we can be a really great resource for rehabs and programs and for hospitals. And and then we have like uh, how to start a PI campaign um, pamphlets and stuff that I can give to literally anyone who asks for it. And they can start it within their district, within their meeting. And it gives like a, you know, a cold call sort of worksheet on how to look up these different places here's the websites you need to call to inform people or at least provide it to your doctor so that they have access to the information um so that you can get the treatment that you need sort of thing so i I think this question kind of is self-explanatory but i want to ask it anyway we've had programs more like uh recovery dharma or smart recovery on and generally we ask a question sort of like who does your program seem to work best for right who in your opinion seems to do better in like a smart recovery versus the 12-step model or better in like recovery dharma which is more a buddhist kind of recovery than a 12-step model and i i you know yours obviously is still a 12-step model and i think who it works best for obviously is people who are more specifically concerned (laughs) concerned about their marijuana usage and yet is there any other like thoughts you have around that idea of like who would best be served or get help or find marijuana anonymous useful like would it just be people who are already in 12-step programs who question whether they should continue their marijuana usage or is it people who've just marijuana seems like their drug of choice. Like what specifies that your program is probably a good fit for them? Um, I think that's a really great question and I don't want to like rush through the answer. That's fair. It's interesting because I think like other programs, we're there, we're here to help the addict who still suffers in whatever capacity that means for them. Um, and the people that can benefit the most from our program are people who are willing to go to any lengths to experience a spiritual awakening, spiritual freedom from addiction and physical and emotional freedom from addiction. And, and like all the same pillars of other programs who are, who are willing to be honest and open-minded and thorough. And I'm not saying that you can't get that in smart recovery or in, in like recovery Dharma or anything like that, But it could also be for people from other programs who just haven't found their footing in AA because of their marijuana addiction or, you know, people in NA who, you know, this is where they were sent for their marijuana addiction because they didn't know that we existed. 
Um, but at the same time, for a lot of people, and this is their first and last stop on the block, um, it's because when they came in, they they were like, I kind of get AA because I've seen it in the media. I know like people sit around and introduce themselves, you know, by their first name only and say, hi, I'm an addict. And everyone's like, hi, Mark. And then it's the whole thing. Like they're comfortable because they have a, a notion about what 12 step is from media and from just like life experiences I think a lot of people can at least name one person in their life that's been at least to one 12-step meeting one AA meeting so they kind of get the gist but they're like so I'm comfortable here I don't have to learn an entirely new religion like Buddhism or something like that right and I feel like I'm at home here because these are my people like these are stoners and now they're just sober and I'm not saying that you can't find that in other places, but I think for the people who have the capacity to be open-minded and willing, you will find MA to be a very accepting and open place and can watch other people experience the freedom that you are working towards as well. Um, awesome. And that's, I think, one of the, the cool things about it. It's very similar to other programs like that. Um, if not, it's sort of that same promise of like, you will find that here if you are ready to find that here. Right. It's very right. simple. It's not easy, but it's very simple. And lots of us have found it. So it can be for you. And people who like that idea, um, who are also marijuana addicts, will, you know, hopefully flourish in our program. That's awesome. Molly, we are getting close on time. What we need to do is to know how to find these resources and meetings and everything. Uh, I'm assuming the the app is called Marijuana Anonymous and it's on the iPhone store. iTunes. Yeah, it's iTunes. The, yeah. <laughs> and the Apple, I mean, in yeah. the Google store. Uh, you can find us on yeah. the, you can find um, the app in the, you know, app store the Apple App Store, Android App Stores, the, what is that called? Like the Google, Google Play. all of that Google stuff. Play, Just yeah. search up Marijuana Anonymous and it'll show up. It's a green logo. It says M-A in a triangle. Of course it's green. <laughs> 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 and then, um, <laughs> then you can find us on um, online at marijuana-anonymous.org. Um, we on there we have a meeting finder that can help you find meetings that are close to your area if not in your area they're in person online and hybrid meetings and all of our literature all of our resources can also be found on our website man free yeah that Whew. is so awesome <laughs> yeah I don't know yeah we look bad sorry <laughs> And free, looks free. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Molly, thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning with us. We really Very appreciate early it. Too. Thank you, Molly. Yes, yes, thank you, Molly. Early out there on the West Coast. Yeah. And thank you for informing us and our audience about Marijuana Anonymous. I mean, I'm there's people out there who don't know and, and need to know. And I just I really appreciate you coming on and helping us describe it to people so that they can be a little less scared about going. Yeah, and technology makes it easy for us to find our tribe, you That's know. Right. So now that all this stuff has opened up and, and meetings are around virtually, you know, you can find a group of like-minded people that you have a lot in common with, feel connected to. I think that's a huge part of people's recovery process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Molly, it was a pleasure meeting you. I hope you have a good week. Thank you, Molly. You Thank you. Well. Thank you, guys. I had a blast. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Did you like this episode? Share it with people you think might get something out of it. Check out the rest of our episodes at recoverysortof.com. Also, while you're there, you can find ways to link up with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, YouTube, anything. We're always looking for new ideas. Got an idea you want us to look into? Reach out to us.